Welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. A 25 year old male presented to ER with alleged history of accidental ingestion of diluted phenol 15 minutes prior to arrival to ER. On initial 10 second assessment, airway was patent, no pooling uh, of secretions, no gurgling sounds, no uh, hoarseness of voice, okay. breathing, uh, respiratory rate was 18 per minute, saturation 98 percentage room air, uh, air entry bilaterally equal. Coming to circulation, BP was 110 bar 70 millimeters of mercury, pulse rate 90 per minute, all peripheral pulsations equally felt. Disability GCS was 15 by 15, pupil sequent reacting to light and exposure patient was ephebrile. Coming to history, a 25 year old male uh, with no known comorbidities presented to ER with alleged history of accidental ingestion of diluted phenol 15 minutes prior to arrival to ER. He gives history of ingestion ab about uh, approximately 10 ml of the solution. Uh, no history of any vomiting, abdominal pain, any oral burns, palpitations, altered mental status. Allergy, um, uh, allergic history, no drug allergies, uh, no significant past medical history and no regular medicines. Uh, last meal was 4 hours prior to the episode. We had taken a VBG showing pH of 7.369, potassium of 3.5, sodium 136, calcium 1.18, lactate of 2, creatine 0.97 and bicarbonate is 22. ECG showing normal sinus rhythm with no SCT changes. Uh, uh, on examination, the patient was conscious oriented, no palarectal sinuses, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or edema. Uh, mm. On local examination, there was no oral or uh, local burns was not there, no swollen tongue, no oral ulcers. Uh, respiratory system and uh, normal vesicular breath sounds was heard, uh, it was clear. And other systems were within normal limit. Okay. So, uh Actually, uh, we didn't know it was phenol or he said it was no, phenol? He, said, he was a cleaner in Amanda, okay. so he uh, didn't He know, know that it was phenol. So, majority of the time, we don't know what was the ingestion. Yeah. So, that is the scenario that we will uh, deal with this patient. So, what will be the reason? An unknown ingestion yeah. has come to you. So, unknown ingestion come to you. Our aim, uh, the problem is that uh, the phenol per se or anything per se, you can have different type of exposure. Yeah. It can skin exposure, it can cause, uh, it can irritation to your eyes. Yes. So, it can even vaporized form, it can because the concentration if it is very high, even in the vaporized form can inhalational injuries can happen. And this one, they have uh, consumed it. So, it is more of an ingestion wise. So, ingestion wise, any corrosives like that, we need to manage uh, carbolic acid. Uh, so, that is basically phenol. So, uh, the thing, the mo most important thing will be the challenge challenges will be uh, here will be the airway management only because there can be associated airway because the patient can aspirate the same amount of uh, consumption whenever he feels that it is not an edible thing he will start uh, spitting it out so that time he can have some amount of aspiration so uh, choking can happen so these are all local and local airway burns local oral cavity burns can all things can happen Be here he was he was lucky enough because it was a diluted solution so he never had any major symptoms except for minimum localized uh, erythema and and all those things so uh, just 10 ml and uh, he was otherwise asymptomatic so when you look into the phenol or any corrosive ingestion what are our problems will be the decontamination and the role of our activated charcoal so the first thing the when we say decontamination i am telling about uh, skin decontamination can be done if there is exposure to the skin if exposure to the eye you can wash all those things can be done but GI decontamination per se induction of MSS and uh, 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 gastric lavage and uh, actic, uh, when you look into the really activated charcoal activated charcoal they say not to give but if you are very sure phenol there are some articles they suggest that you can give activated charcoal one dose but uh, when you generally we don't know what the patient has consumed so generally in dictum avoid activated charcoal there is of no benefit with uh, giving much uh, a higher doses or a single dose of an activated charcoal so our problem issue the next thing will be the airway management so airway management because there can be airway edema associated with this so there can be fry very friable uh, tissues and all so there can be bleeding, active bleeding, vocal cord edema and maybe surgical airway may also be required in this case. So, no to GI decontamination, that is the first thing, no induction of MSS, no gastric lavage and uh, and again uh, regarding neutralizing, consuming of neutralizing agent, remember uh, avoid the neutralizing agent, can they consume milk? That is a normal antidote to the pre-hospital management, the people will start consuming milk, whether it is recommended or not recommended. What is your... 
because again when you are not very sure what the patient has consumed it is better to avoid these things so uh, rather than giving and creating a problem better not to avoid all those things so bring to the hospital as soon as possible and start uh, assessing their a b c d and uh, uh, the question arises now whether uh, when to go for an endoscopy so that is the only thing that, that option is there in front of us who all need an endoscopy so whether to do an endoscopy when to do the endoscopy so these are the questions so can you answer those uh, things endoscopy is indicated in the very early stage mm. because uh, uh, tissue friability will be very high uh, from 15 to 4, 5 to 14 days uh, endoscopy can be diagnostic and also for um, or rt feed insertion also and um, if there are oral mm -hmm. burns uh, and um, Large tongue, and we we suspect any uh, or I mean esophageal means GI uh, alterations. It is or this uh, active or endoscopy. Preferably within twenty four hours. That is the first thing. Preferably for within first twenty four hours. That is the role for your endoscopy. Or otherwise after two weeks. If you are not doing an endoscopy very early, you can uh, give it uh, after two. Do it after two weeks only. So that is the uh, major indication. Then the next uh, question arises is uh, uh, role of steroids. Whether steroids needed to be given or not. Uh, so blind steroid administration has got no value. So just like that you are giving a steroid so that a possible structure will be there to pro avoid prevention of structure. After endoscopy you are seeing some finding that possibility is there then you can give steroids. So blindly if you are just giving steroids it is not advisable. So blind steroid administration is not needed. So these are the two major things that we need to keep in our mind whether as an ED physician whether to uh, give uh, steroid or whether we have other indication like V's and all we can definitely give but for the per se as such for the ulcer prophylaxis not for the ulcer prevention and uh, structure prevention not ulcer prevention it is actually structure prevention and complication the role of steroid is only after your endoscopy oh, okay so the next possible thing what are the other deadly complications that the patient can have after ingestion of a carbolic acid the aspiration can occur. So that then is the local uh, tissue damage, everything we have discussed. CNS, it is a stimulant, mm. uh, can cause seizures, uh, then uh, uh, alter mental status and then coma. Then cardiac, it can be tachycardia or bradycardia and then uh, then local. Hemolysis, again to the blood, can sometimes hemolysis, very early methemoglobinemia. One of the reason you can think is carbolic acid. So this all can happen and but very 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 rare but once usually this happens metabolic acid doses all those things renal failure all those things can develop but it is not very common that we are seeing but accidental ingestion is that what we mostly see. What is the reason behind accidental ingestion? Uh, it will be uh, kept in the same bottle where we drink our water or we will kept our uh, carbonated drink. So uh, that could be the reason. So it's actually a preventable thing. So mostly uh, this thing should be avoided and uh, uh, either some color coding or uh, some color changes should come. But routinely when you see the cleaning liquids, it will not be very white. It will be some yellow in color or blue in color because of that the people will not consume it. So that is the main reason they are adding colors to this thing. Even when you look into the kerosene, kerosene is uh, not white in color. Actually kerosene is white. When they are adding color to prevent that the patient will not consume this. So that is a main reason uh, why we are uh, adding uh, these colors to the solution. So uh, mostly the phenol the problem will be the local irritation and the local complication and uh, uh, the per se as such what we need to remember is decontamination. Many people will have uh, suspicion whether to uh, do a GA decontamination whether not to do a, do a GA decontamination. So preferably to avoid all those measures and uh, inhalational when you have vapor form you can get inhalation. So that time it can cause severe spasm because in children and all they can come with significant spasm especially in phenol industry. Some Somebody suddenly there is a uh, burst or something happening in a phenol industry or a leather industry. This gas can come to the surrounding and the people you can have a multiple casualty coming with respiratory symptoms they will not have caused anything but they have come with respiratory symptoms so again that is very challenging you need to give adrenaline nebulization so that is the racemic mixture of epinephrine nebulization you need to give it so uh, when you have a phenol per se as such we need to keep in your mind what are the different way by which we can get exposure so phenol is a very commonly available easily available you can have still more of an ingestion but a vaporized form inhalational injury also you need to keep in your mind maybe high 
high flow oxygen like how we start but only one thing you can have a lot of irritation to the lung causing wheezing so adrenaline will be the preferred agent rather than any of our routine uh, uh, beta 2 agonists like salbutamol and all those things which will be better will be to uh, use uh, adrenaline the simic mixture adrenaline or the plain adrenaline you can dilute and give it as a nebulization you can take one ml of adrenaline you can add 2 to 3 ml of normal saline and you can give it as a nebulization for an adult patient even children you need to do it a half or one third of it you have to take depending upon the age group and you get, can give us nebulization so once the patient goes into complication then it is very difficult like metabolic doses they might be requiring hemodialysis and all those other things but as a per se as such it will not cause so, so why are the reason behind uh, renal failure in uh, toxins uh, either the shock can, I mean, so oh, either it can be direct toxin mediated toxin. the directly the toxin can go and hit the kidney so when you uh, talk about the renal failures we all know that direct toxin mediated injury or it co causing some pre renal and post renal very unlikely but uh, you can have uh, hypercalcemia causing stones but later on very later on not immediately mm -hmm. causing on but usually direct impact so uh, you you might need to initiate dialysis so hexacorporeal therapy uh, you should be knowing so the common uh, toxins which all you will do is which all you have so isoniazid mm, commonly what we see uh, lithium lithium okay uh, salicylates okay uh, and the snake venom snake is, uh, so the problem here we are not trying to we have to understand that what is the idea when our idea is to remove the toxin or to decrease the acidosis in snake bite and all mainly what we are doing because of the complication because of the complication that but there are when you say dialyzable toxin that is toxin which can be removed by dialysis so what are dialyzable toxins that is what you have said Salicylate. lithium Salicylate. salicylate uh, isoniazid isoniazid methanol 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 both ethanol toxicity methanol toxicity then ethylene glycol ethylene glycol yes it is a barbiturates again dialyzable toxin where you will use uh, forced alkaline diuresis forced alkaline diuresis forced alkaline diuresis you are giving you are using bicarbonate and you are increasing the uh, pH of the urine. So yes. that is forced alkaline. Right. It is mostly in barbiturates. So phenobarbitone barbiturates. The forced alkaline FAD. The forced acid diuresis is there, not being practiced. But forced right. alkaline diuresis is still in practice. So barbiturates. So you should know what are the common dialysable toxin. And there is another method that is charcoal hemoperfusion. Where we can, we are trying to absorb. It is not absorb. We are trying to absorb the poison. So the classical example is paraquet. When you are doing that is in paraquet. So extracorporeal therapy is then we have the other one is the ECMOS mm -hmm. VA ECMO when we have a calcium channel blocker toxicity we have uh, problems complication developing we have to support the heart also because there is a pump cancer IABP or a VA ECMO all those things you need to do so dialyzable toxin you have to understand this toxin will be dialyzed removed by the dialysis but snake venom actually it some amount will be removed but most our idea is to treat the complication so the question you can ask is uh, if ASU is not available can be dialysis but of no use because already why the AK is occurring is due to the toxin mediated effect to the uh, kidneys happening it will not remove the toxin acid but there's another one is cytosorb therapy cytosorb therapy because of the snake bite and all the most what is the more most important problem in any sepsis or anything that is happening what is the most important uh, uh, cytokine mediator what is the most important? Phospholipase A2. So, phospholipase A2 is a major culprit. So, this PLA2 is a culprit. We'll have the PLA2. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the snake venom also, there is a, some PLA2. So, that PLA2 will start creating problem and that will start increasing problem. Phospholipase A2 will start creating problem in our body. So, if there is a cytokine storm, uh, we can check the IL-6 level. There are a uh, few centers where we can check the interleukin level. When it is very high, we can say that it is cyto cytokine storm and we can do cytosol therapy. We are removing all the cytosol. That's nothing. This molecular weight substance is all, all removed through this filter. The blood is running through the filter. Whatever will be the molecular weight higher than this will be removed. So that is cytokine therapy. So we have done for two, three patients with snake animation. So it is one of the rare treatment. But what we are doing because of the venom induced cytokine storm, we are trying to remove all the cytokine from the body. The problem what will happen? 
the normal inflammatory mediators normal wbcs also will be taken away so there can be sudden deterioration to the patient also can happen so it will not differentiate whether to remove the white blood cells some white blood cells are required for us it will remove everything which is above this molecular weight which is above this size so it will be removed so there can be sudden deterioration also so but you have to balance it so uh, when you have suddenly the patient will have toxic hypotension noradrenaline requiring is increasing you have nothing else to offer renal failure is there so on top of dialysis we are just adding one kit also only just we are adding it will be a cartridge sort of a thing it will be added to the dialysis kit so all the cytokines will be taken away so that is called cytokine storm so just i am telling extracorporeal therapies what all things you can do in an uh, toxicology patient but remember the most important when you have a corrosive injection our aim is to a b c d management electrolyte disturbance is very common because they will have multiple episode of vomiting so we'll have metabolic alkalosis so fluid correction you have to correct the potassium and all those things these are our major thing anything you have prepared you have added we can uh, present now disposition of a yeah. corrosive uh, asymptomatic patient with low risk ingestions and no signs of drooling strider or vomiting or who can tolerate food and drink can be discharged from ed after a brief ideally period. this fellow can be uh, after 6 hours of observation we can discharge him okay grade 1 injury uh, of the uh, esophageal injury discharge after endoscopy and 2a it require hospitalization 2b and 3 will be requiring parenteral or enteral dilatation okay icu okay okay so what he was discharged after yeah, he was discharged, he was discharged from the eating